Hey everyone, welcome to Introduction to Cognitive Science. I'm Adam and the focus of our lecture today is evolutionary psychology, the emotions and facial expressions. One of our main goals in the course is to think about the mind through different disciplinary perspectives and levels of analysis. In our first lecture, we saw that David Marr provided three levels of analysis for understanding any information processing system. This included the computational level, the algorithmic level, and the implementation level. So when we were thinking about the cognitive neuroscience and language, for example, uh, which areas of the brain are responsible for processing syntactic and semantic information, we were focusing on the implementation level. Yesterday, when we discussed perceptual symbol systems, as well as amodal symbol systems, we were focusing on the algorithmic level. And recall that the algorithmic level of analysis is concerned with the representational format of thought. Okay, so in the last lecture, we looked at amodal symbol systems, which is endorsed by classical computationalism, as well as perceptual symbol systems, which is endorsed by embodied cognition. Some of the questions that we asked last lecture include the following. Are our thoughts mental representations? Are our thoughts analog mental representations similar to images or pictures? Or are our thoughts arbitrary mental representations similar to a computer language, like ones and zeros? Is the cognitive system modular and encapsulated from the sensory and motor systems? Or is the cognitive system intimately integrated with the sensory and motor systems? So yesterday we thought about the algorithmic level. Today, we will turn to focus primarily on the computational level of understanding information processing systems. In Mars' book Vision, uh, he asked the question regarding the computational level, what is the goal of the computation? Why is it appropriate? And what is the logic of the strategy by which it can be carried out? So today, we will think about the goals of information processing operations, cognitions or computations, and the logic of the strategy for their development and, and execution. For example, some questions that we'll think about today include the following. What is the function or objective of the emotions? In other words, what do emotions do? How do emotions evolve? In other words, why do we have them? What is the function or objective of facial expressions? What do facial expressions do? And how do facial expressions evolve? In other words, why do we have facial expressions? Since we will be drawing upon evolutionary biology and anthropology in our discussion of human cognitive evolution, Another main goal for today is to appreciate the contributions from evolutionary biology and anthropology to our knowledge of the human mind. All right, this is just to emphasize the importance of the subdiscipline of anthropology to our interdisciplinary field, cognitive science. All right, we'll go ahead and cover a few broad concepts and points, and then we'll go ahead in subsequent slides look at these in more fine-grained detail. Okay, so this first slide is just to point out two important figures in the history of um, evolution, right? We have Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. Both of these figures published important work on evolution by natural selection in 1858. And when Darwin realized that Alfred Russell Wallace was also working on this, he was motivated to publish his book on the origins of species by means of natural selection in 1859. Okay. Both figures are important and contributed to our knowledge of evolution by natural selection and their importance, both of their importance is uh, highlighted in this Darwin Wallace medal. 
which is issued by the Linnean Society on the 50th anniversary of the reading of Darwin and Wallace's papers on evolution by natural selection. All right, in order to understand evolution by natural selection, we have to understand variation. Okay. Variation refers to the fact that individuals of a species differ from each other. This is what we call exhibiting variation. Right, so as humans, although we're both members of the same species, we look different and we have different attributes, different eye color or hair color or height, right? Similarly, finches uh, differ in their variety. Right? We have finches that have thinner bills for probing and we also have finches with thicker bills for crushing. In a particular environment, we can have finches of different varieties in that environment. Okay, so imagine an environment where perhaps there's a lot of trees with thin crevices where food sources hide for the finch. So in order to get at the food source, uh, let me rephrase that, finches that have thin bills would be better suited or be more successful in probing those narrow areas for food sources, okay? So we see that in such an environment where food is hiding in small crevices, we see that that environment selects for finches with narrow rather than thick fat bills, okay? So in certain environments, certain traits are adaptive and others are maladaptive. In that example that I just created for you, we see that thin bills are adaptive for that environment where food is hiding in small crevices. But thick bills, fat bills, large ones, if you will, are maladaptive because in that environment, having such a trait would make it difficult to pick your food sources. Okay, so with respect to that environment, a given trait, right, like your bill size will be adaptive or maladaptive. And this is the general idea behind natural selection, right, that based on a recurring adaptive problem in the environment, like finding food, uh, given that recurring adaptive problem, a trait that we have or that I have will e either um, solve that problem or not solve that problem adequately, okay? And those of us that are of a variety of the species that are better able to solve that problem will be more successful in surviving and reproducing than those of us in the species that are of a different variety, okay? All right, so natural selection, for example, being a finch with a narrow bill, is going to allow me to successfully procure more food. That will allow me to live longer and that will allow me to have more reproductive opportunities in which I can mate and create offspring that have the genetic material that I have for narrow probing bills, okay? All right, so we can see how Having a narrow probing bill is adaptive in certain environments, but not in other very different environments, right? Imagine there was a natural disaster and for example, uh, a comet landed and destroyed all the trees, right? Um, well, now that finch with a narrow probing bill, you know, it may no longer be a good fit for that new environmental condition. Right, or that new ecological condition. On the other hand, the finch with a thicker bill for crushing, right, it might do a better job in this new environment. Right? If, if all the trees and whatnot were burned down and fell to the ground, it may leave a, a kind of rubble on the floor in which now in order to find food, you have to smash things and um, to go underneath and find food sources, right? So we see that in the new environmental condition that the thicker bill will now become adaptive, right? And this is to point out the fact that traits are not good 
or bad in themselves, but rather with respect to certain environments or environmental conditions. All right. And we see here when we're looking at the bills of finches that having a, a particular type of bill in a particular ecological condition can be adaptive, right? And by that, we mean it's helpful for survival in this case, right? Being able, being adapted to get food is a survival advantage, right? However, not all of our traits, all the traits that we possess or that finches and other animals possess serve that survival function, okay? Not all traits are selected for natural selection, okay? And a clear example of this is the peacock, all right? So look at the figure below and you see that while the peahen, the female, is not very colorful and doesn't have the bright large feathers but the peacock on the other hand the male is very colorful and has these large feathers okay and intuitively we might see this as an incredible um it, this could be a very dangerous thing to have right being this peacock with these colorful feathers not only makes you uh, visually apparent to potential mates, but it also makes you visually apparent to predators, right? So you're with these feathers, you're attracting more than just mates here. You're potentially attracting predators as well, okay? So given the fact that these feathers can attract predators and given the fact that these feathers may weigh you down when you're trying to escape from a predator, we see that compared to a more bland, less colorful peacock, that this one uh, faces a challenge, right? Or, or at least another way to put this is that there's a cost to having this plumage and this coloration, right? There's a, a survival cost here, okay? And this survival cost needs to be outweighed by its benefit as a reproductive tool, right? Remember that the most important thing for evolution is not our own individual survival, but rather the survival and continuation of our genes for subsequent generations, okay? At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how long I live as an individual, right? The, the amount of life that I live is really only important in so far as the longer I live, I will have more reproductive opportunities, okay? Um, if I live to be 200, but I never reproduce, then by the time my 200 years is up, well, then my genes will, will die with me, right? Or they will fail to be reproduced. Um, you know, I will, have not, I will not have made more instances of individuals that share my genetic material for living however long I lived, right? Um, so what's important is not just duration of life, but rather the duration of life is important because it gives us more reproductive opportunities. And it's the reproductive opportunities that are important is because via reproduction, we create more instances of ourselves for subsequent generations. And it's those offspring that we produce that are going to uh, populate, right, the, the species in subsequent generations, okay? So we see that it's in some sense okay, right, if this peacock doesn't live forever, right, as long as it lives long enough to be successful in reproduction, okay? And insofar as it has these bright um, feathers, it'll be more successful in attracting mates and reproducing, even if it does add to, it adds a cost in terms of survival, okay? So having the peacock feathers 
is a result of sexual selection rather than natural selection. Whereas having a certain bill as a finch is the result of natural selection as opposed to sexual selection. Okay. And the feathers may be sexually selected for, for different reasons, right? It may be that it does a better job of grabbing the attention of potential mates. It can also be an honest indicator of the quality of the genetic material in the peacock, right? In order to produce such beautiful feathers, such large feathers with symmetry, right? The genetic material has to be high quality, okay? So there may be, you know, um, for any trait that an animal has, it may be a consequence of natural selection or sexual selection, okay? And, um, or it also just might be a, a byproduct of, of this process, okay? Um, so it's important that we understand natural selection and sexual selection here, because as we continue to think about human traits and cognitive abilities, we can always ask, what does this trait serve as a, an adaptive solution to, right? Like what's the recurring problem that makes this trait useful and therefore why all of us humans have it, okay? Um, when we think about things like spatial navigation, like basic visual processing, right? This may serve a more of a natural function, right? It may have been selected for via natural selection, right? If we didn't have vision, it may be very hard for us to survive. However, other aspects of our behavior, our cognitive system, may be a consequence of sexual selection too, right? And when we get to the lecture tomorrow on the evolution of language and music, it'll be a nice opportunity for us to ask ourselves again, right? Um, what does music, for example, what's the function of music? Why do we have music? And you know, what recurring problem in the environment might music um, be adapted for? And so our adaptive traits, the traits that we possess, which help us solve some recurring problem in the environment, whether that's a survival problem or a reproductive problem, we see that those traits that are useful or adaptive will be passed on to subsequent generations via our offspring, okay? And those that are not helpful or those that are maladaptive will not be passed on, okay? If I have, a uh, mutation and that produces some crazy feature on me and I'm unable to reproduce or survive because of that, then I won't be able to pass on my mutation to offspring and subsequent generations. All right. On this slide, we'll go ahead and review briefly some of the main forces of natural selection and then in subsequent slides, we'll look at them in more detail, okay? One force of natural selection is mutation, which is any change to the DNA sequence of an organism. Another force of natural selection is natural and sexual selection. And this refers to the differential survival and reproduction of individuals due to differences in phenotype. Another force of natural selection is gene flow or the movement of genes from one population to another as a result of dispersal. And another force of natural selection is genetic drift. Random change in how common an allele is within a population. Two important concepts for us to understand from when we're talking about evolution, genotype and phenotype. The genotype refers to the genetic material of an organism. So for example, I have some genetic constitution. Phenotype refers to the observable traits or characteristics of an organism. For example, I have certain color eyes and hair. Okay. The genotype, right, my particular set of instructions, my genetic material, are gonna produce my eye color and hair color. Okay, or at least there'll be a genotype phenotype mapping. Um, 
which is a mapping from the set of genotypes to the set of phenotypes. Okay, we're just trying to find the relationship between genes and traits. Okay, so we'll, we can look for the genetic instructions for um, hair color, eye color, um, certain cognitive uh, abilities or disabilities and whatnot. Okay, and we'll see here in a few slides in chromosome one um, that there's genes for, for example, brain size. Okay, we saw that there was variation in finches. And we saw that, for example, finches have different size bills, some for um, probing and some for smashing. Okay, similarly, we see that there is variation in humans. Okay, and, and just as we saw that a bill or a particular trait of a finch is not good or bad in itself, but is adaptive or maladaptive with respect to certain environments, we see a, a similar thing here with humans, right? Importantly, uh, human skin color or pigmentation is not good or bad in itself, but is adaptive or maladaptive with respect to certain environmental contexts or conditions. So we see here in this figure that people come in all sorts of beautiful colors. Um, and this serves a function with respect to certain environmental conditions, okay? People from different regions of the world differ in how much of the pigment you melanin their skin cells produce, resulting in lighter or darker colored skin. You melanin acts as a natural sunscreen. So having more eumelanin may be advantageous or adaptive in regions where sunlight is intense or extreme. Ultraviolet light from the sun can cause damage to the DNA. So too much sun exposure can lead to skin cancer. Yet um, having more eumelanin may be disadvantageous or maladaptive in regions where sunlight is rare. Ultraviolet light from the sun is also used to break down folate and produce vitamin D, which helps to absorb, uh, helps the body absorb calcium and develop strong bones and a skeletal system. So we see that um, not having sun is bad, but having too much sun is also bad, right? So um, the production of eumelanin, right, is not in itself a good or bad thing, but rather it can be helpful in certain environmental conditions, um, but not helpful in other environmental conditions, okay? And this just shows that the distribution of eumelanin in human skin is an adaptation to varying levels of sunlight in different environments. All right, to further appreciate these points, let's review some basic evolutionary biology. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, which we can see right here, right? This is one pair, this is another pair. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes or 46 chromosomes total. In humans, chromosome one, so this one right here has about 2000 genes. Right, so we can see chromosome one is right here. I've blown this up for you. And we see that there's about 2000 genes on chromosome one, including a gene that influences brain size and a gene responsible for glaucoma. Because human chromosomes come in pairs, every individual has two copies of each gene, one on each chromosome. The father and mother alleles, um, which is one of the versions of a gene that are passed down from any particular gene 
may be identical on both chromosomes, which we see here, right? There's both a red strip here, or they could be different, right? And so here we see a red and a green strip, okay? Only one copy of each chromosome is needed for gametes or mature male or female germ cells like sperm or eggs. Since the gamete from one parent will pair up with the gamete from the other parent to create a new individual or offspring. Okay, and we can see here are the production of the egg and the sperm. We see that the material is provided in here and then they combine to produce the zygote, which will turn into the offspring. In the process of making gametes known as meiosis, the chromosomes within the cell align with their identical pairs. Next, the chromosomes become intertwined and exchange chunks between pairs through the process called recombination. Due to the process of recombination, the resulting chromosomes can contain combinations of alleles that were not present in either parent. This process of recombination is one of the ways that variation in a population is generated, okay? We saw earlier that variation is required for natural and sexual selection. A question arises though, is what produces variation? And this is a partial answer, right? This is one of the, one of the ways that variation is generated, okay? Through this crossing over and recombination. All right, different varieties of the same species can exist in an area. And uh, this was something that I mentioned in passing about the finches is that you might have different varieties of finches existing in the same area, right? There may be finches with narrower bills for probing and finches with thicker bills for crushing or smashing. And both of those varieties may be located in one area. The different varieties of the same species, so different varieties of finches, different varieties of fruit flies, uh, they're going to um, differ, right? The, they're gonna differ in the order in which the genes occur on a chromosome, okay? So you might ask, what is responsible for the different phenotypic expression? right, the different phenotypes that we see in finches, right, some have big thick bills, other have narrow thin bills for probing, right, and remember that that phenotype is related to the genotype, right, and so what we're going to ask here is, um, what's the difference that underlies that phenotype difference, okay, and it's going to be the order or sequence of genes on a chromosome, this difference in the order of genes on a chromosome may arise from mutation, such as when a section of a, the chromosome containing the genes becomes inverted, okay? And the biologist uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky contributed some very important work on this topic. So the biologist Theodosius Dobzhansky, Dobzhansky found this finding um, in a relative of the fruit fly called Drosophila pseudo-obscura. And here we see that this is just an example of uh, genes um, on a chromosome. Okay, and we can see that the sequence is CBA, CBA, CBA. And here, right, there was like a, a copy error or this was inverted, okay? And we'll discuss uh, ways in which mutations can occur. Charles Darwin had emphasized the importance of variation for natural selection, as we saw in the beginning of the lecture. And now Dobzhansky had found evidence for variation at the genetic level, okay? And this is through his work on the fruit flies, which we'll look at here. So Dobzhansky conducted an experiment 
where he took both varieties of flies, ABC flies and CBA flies. So these two different types of flies had different sequencing, okay, which we see here. Okay, the different varieties of the same species differ in the order in which genes occurred on a chromosome. Okay, and so Dubzansky is studying a relative of the fruit. <coughs> Excuse me, fly here. <coughs> Excuse me. So Dubzansky had fruit flies, um, ABC flies, one variation, and another variation, CBA flies. Okay. He took both varieties of flies and raised them in containers in the lab. At the beginning of the experiment, each container had the same number of ACB and CBA flies. Or they should be ABC, okay. Um, each container has the same number of ABC and CBA flies. Okay, so in the beginning, right? Just imagine these two containers have the same number of each fly. We'll just say there's like 50 flies, 50 ABC flies, 50 CBA flies in container one, 50 ABC flies, 50 CBA flies in container two, okay? In the beginning, everything is even. Now, the fun part, some containers of flies, like uh, we we'll just call it container one, were kept at room temperature. The other container of flies were kept at cold temperature. And that's what we see here in this figure. Okay, in the last figure, it was the same. Here we have a warmer container or a, a warmer temperature. Here we have a colder temperature. Okay. After four months of leaving the fruit flies in these different environments, right, different temperature environments, um, Dubzansky counted the number of each variety of fly in the containers. Dubzansky found that room temperature containers had twice as many CBA flies as ABC flies. Dubzansky also found that the cold temperature containers had twice as many ABC flies as CBA flies. So the opposite result. Here, Dubzansky demonstrated that natural selection could act on differences in temperature to cause one variety to become more common than another. Okay? And this is one of the reasons why fruit flies and relatives of fruit flies are so awesome to study is because they have a relatively short lifespan so we can get more reproductive generations out of them, right? So at four months, we get about four generations of flies, right? And so we can see evolution already, evolution by natural selection already occurring in this short time span, okay? And here are the results for us, right? On the left is the warm or room temperature container, right? And we see here that there's now more CBA flies than ABC flies in that container. And in the cold container, we see that there's more ABC flies than CBA flies, the opposite result, okay? So that's really cool. And what's really awesome about Dubzansky's work is that like Darwin, Darwin had an idea about variation in traits, but he was missing, he didn't know yet at that time, sort of like the genetic basis of it, right? So this is awesome because Dobzhansky is sort of adding a genetic, he's, he's finding similar ideas in terms of genetic variation, okay? The insight here is that natural selection acts as a filter for which traits can pass from one generation to the next. Dubzansky suggested that evolution could even be defined by a change in how common an allele is within a population. Dubzansky published Genetics and the Origins of Species in 1937, and some of the main points an organism's traits can be traced to alleles, the alternative versions of each gene passed from one generation to the next. 
in a population of organisms, the variation in traits reflects variation in alleles. And natural selection occurs when some organisms leave more offspring than others, passing on more of their alleles to the next generation. Okay, and we see here that Dubzansky uh, showed a similar thing with flies, fruit flies, as had been identified um, by Darwin, right, in terms of the variation of bills on finches, okay? And there's some other work, right, where we see variation in moths. These are the, pep the peppered moths. And in another cool study, we see that in, you see down below, this white colored peppered moth is better blended into its environment, right? So you could see that this peppered moth would be more adaptive for this environmental condition. And indeed, when the environment looks like this, we find more light colored peppered moths. Okay, however, when the environment changes, there was a nice photo online. Um, I didn't screen grab it though, but there's another nice photo where you find this peppered moth um, against a dark background, right? It's like the environment had been contaminated or polluted or turned black for some reason. And now because of the black environment, this white peppered moth would stick out like a sore thumb, right? So in that new environment, we find that all of a sudden this colored moth, the dark peppered moth becomes more widespread, okay? So very cool that we see that one variety becomes more popular or widespread throughout the population given different environmental conditions. Okay, and here the conditions are warmer temperature versus colder temperature, and here the conditions are a lighter background environment versus darker background environment. Okay. All right, so to understand evolution, it's very helpful we understand what DNA and RNA are. Okay, DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, and James Watson and Francis Crick contributed to our understanding of DNA, as well as some other scholars. So I just wanna to try to point out people that have contributed important work, even though they might not always get attention for their work, but Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin also contributed important work. They did very important work for our understanding of DNA. So DNA has three parts. Uh, phosphates, sugars, and bases. And we can see here in this figure, the phosphates and sugars form the backbone of the structure. Okay, so we have phosphates and sugars providing the backbone or skeleton of this um, double helix structure. Okay. And the bases, they face towards the center and pair with their complements. Um, and we see here, right? So the complement base pairings are right inside here, okay? And each base has a complement, okay? So the four bases are provided here, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And we see that um, adenine pairs with thymine and cytosine pairs with guanine, okay? Or A pairs with T, C pairs with G. Okay, and we see that here, T matches with A, A matches with T, C matches with G, G matches with C, okay? And the sequence of bases is what contains the information. And by sequence of bases, we can see that here. The DNA bases or a kind of chemical alphabet. And all the words are three letters long. Three DNA bases together in a sequence form a code that is used by the cell to create the building blocks for another type of molecule called a protein. Proteins perform important functions inside the cell, 
include forming structures, carrying out chemical reactions, and carrying messages around different parts of the cell and between cells. So to make a protein, the information stored in DNA is first transcribed into RNA or ribonucleic acid. RNA then travels outside of the nucleus to a particular structure in the cytoplasm of the cell. The three letter code of the RNA specifies a particular type of amino acid and amino acids form the building blocks of proteins. A particular protein is coded by a stretch of DNA and that stretch of DNA is what we call a gene. So here we see that the information stored in DNA is first transcribed into RNA, okay? RNA travels outside of the nucleus to a particular structure in the cytoplasm of the cell. The three-letter code of the RNA specifies a type of amino acid. So here is the amino acid, and the amino acids form um, the building blocks of proteins. And here we see proteins, growing proteins. The ultimate basis for genes and heredity is a chemical called DNA. And here we see DNA contains these four bases that are organized into a sequence. The sequence of DNA bases forms a code for how to make proteins. And each protein that a cell needs is coded by a particular sequence of DNA called a gene. Occasionally, copying errors occur, and we call these mutations. Some mutations have a large negative or positive impact. Some mutations do not have a noticeable impact. Some changes within genes can occur without any consequences at all. This is because the DNA code for amino acids is redundant. In other words, more than one three-letter sequence codes for the same amino acid. And we can see that here in the genetic code that I provided here, okay? And here in this top figure, I just point out that mutations can occur in different ways. In the previous example, let's see if I can find it real quick. Here, we see that this mutation was from an inversion, right? Um, where the section of the chromosome containing these genes became inverted. That was in the, the fly. Here, we see that this mutation is just, um, instead of the whole thing being flipped, right? It's just, instead of it copying a G here, it copied another C. Okay, so you see there's a C and then a G. This is a C, this should then be a G, right? Because we know that C pairs with G. And here we have a C, but we have another C here. Okay, so this is a mutation, okay? It's just a different type of mutation than the previous example that we saw, okay? So this is an example of a mutation. However, what we're trying to show here is that not all mutations are bad or even do anything. And that's due to the fact that more than one three-letter sequence codes for the same amino acid, okay? Consider the possible sequences for the amino acid um, isolacine, okay? We see here, uh, right here, we see that there's th three ways, three, three letter sequence codes for this amino acid, right? And I put, I provided that for you here, right? We can code for that amino acid with ATT or ATC or ATA, okay? So notice that because there's three codes that are acceptable for this amino acid, that if there was a mutation that uh, changed from T to C, or from T to A, that in that case, it wouldn't have a, 
uh, an impact, a noticeable impact, because it's the mutation resulted in the same amino acid. Okay. So this is just, a, I think this is a helpful way to see that some mutations do result in the change, but other mutations do not result in the change. And this is why some mutations um, don't result in a noticeable difference. Okay. So a random mutation that changes the third letter in the sequence from a T to a C would not make a difference for the function of the gene here. Mutations provide an important source of variation. And mut mutations can even be influenced by the environment, such as exposure to x-rays. Differences in skin color, as we mentioned before, can be the result of a single DNA base difference. Whether there is a G or a C at a particular location in a gene called SCL24A5 which plays a role in producing the skin pigment eumelanin. Variations that are harmful or maladaptive are not passed on to subsequent generations, whereas variations that are helpful or adaptive are passed on to subsequent generations. Interestingly enough, fathers contribute four times more mutations to children than do mothers since sperm cells undergo more mutation than egg cells. The greater number of cell divisions that take place when making sperm means that there is a greater chance for mutations compared to the process of making eggs. In one study of men in Iceland, it was found that there were about two mutations for every 23 cell divisions. Fun fact, the human genome has about 20 to 22,000 protein coding genes on 23 chromosomes made up of over 3 billion base pairs. It's a lot of information. All right, next, we've talked about mutation now. Let's talk about gene flow. Gene flow is the movement of genes from one population to another as a result of dispersal. Gene flow has played an important role in human history. Archaeological evidence suggests that our species first evolved in Africa between 300,000 and 200,000 years ago. By 60,000 years ago, humans expanded through Asia and Europe. Eventually, waves of migrants found their way to distant regions throughout the world. And we can see here, sort of like an origin story right, origins here, and then dispersal, right, movement to more distant and even more distant locations, okay. And luckily for me, I ended up somewhere over here in sunny California. All right, so when individuals of a species live close enough together, on the same island, for example, they can easily interact, mate, and produce offspring. Offspring have a mixture of genes from their parents. Mutations that arise can eventually spread throughout the population. And gene flow through sexual reproduction keeps differences from accumulating. In the Galapagos, where there are multiple islands, the distance between them has created separate, uh, separation between populations. Finches living on one island may develop mutations that make them different from the finches living on another island. After enough time passes without finches from each island coming together to mate, they will eventually accumulate enough differences to become distinct species. Reproductive isolation produces speciation because it allows differences to accumulate. All right, so here we see that if we have finches, right, that are just, say they're all on one island and we, um, they are able to reproduce with each other and uh, share genetic material over subsequent generations, right? They will 
not develop into different species, right? Because they are mixing with each other, right? In sort of the same pool. However, if we have finches now separated, right, by space, for example, if a piece of land separates, right, or maybe somehow a certain number of finches end up on a different island and then begin to reproduce and procreate on that island. Well, the physical difference will prevent um, inter um, reproduction, right, among the finches on the two different islands. And so by preventing reproduction, this will allow for speciation or uh, increasing differences among the finches because they're separated on different physical locations. Okay. So if you have two different, if you have uh, two varieties of the same species on different islands for subsequent generations, make that enough generations and they may um, turn into different species, all right? Or this is called speciation. And one more thing to talk about today is genetic drift, okay? Genetic drift is the random fluctuation in how common alleles are within a population. Genetic drift can happen in any population, but it is especially pronounced in very small populations. Any population that is suddenly reduced to a small size is likely to have a different mix of genes than the larger population had. For example, if I randomly select five students at UC Berkeley, right, if the population was reduced to that number, the smaller population I select will likely have a different mixture than the larger population, right? So there's a certain distribution of, you know, ethnicities and ages on campus. And if I just select a couple people, right, the distribution is going to be not representative of that larger sample, right? Similarly, if I just take two Americans, my sample of two is not gonna be representative of the distribution that we find in the larger population, okay? So we see that like in certain situations, maybe through uh, an environmental disaster, like maybe an asteroid hits and wipes out a large number of people, okay? We can see uh, genetic drift occur. In, um, in very small populations especially, the effect of random events becomes amplified, increasing genetic drift. Genetic drift tends to reduce genetic diversity within a population, okay? So what we're doing is we just, the importance of talking about gene flow and genetic drift is just to provide more context for the mechanisms of evolution. Okay, we know that um, evolution occurs by the processes of natural and se sexual selection, but there are also some other cool things going on as well that are uh, importantly related. All right, so the modern synthesis, this is sort of our modern view of evolutionary biology. I'll just sort of summarize the main points here. Genes, are located on chromosomes and are the basis of heritable traits. Genes are passed intact from parents to their offspring. Mutation and recombination are random processes that create new genetic diversity. Genetic traits that are beneficial become more common over generations through natural selection. Natural selection is not the only mechanisms for life to evolve since the movement of individuals leads to gene flow between populations. And finally, genetic traits can become more or less common over generations through genetic drift. And here we have a nice figure that shows the evolutionary tree of hominins. And we can see in this tree that we share, so we're right here, homo sapiens, and this is our relative, our closest relative here, the chimpanzee. 
So we see that we share a common ancestor with the chimpanzee until as recently as five to seven million years ago. Around that time, there was a speciation event. Okay, like I had mentioned before about speciation, right? Similarly, there was a speciation event, um, you know, some time ago, say in the excess of seven million years ago, where uh, this created two lineages. One lineage would lead to chimpanzees. And the other lineage would lead to hominins, some of which eventually became humans. And here's another figure showing human and chimpanzee skulls and brains, right? So we know that hu uh, humans and chimpanzees are sort of distant relatives. And here we can see that there's, due to the, relationship here, there is also similarities in structure, okay? And this is just a picture of the human and chimpanzee skull and the human and chimpanzee brain. Okay. All right, now that we have, so up to this point, I wanted to provide you with a background of basic evolutionary theory. Okay, so now we have an understanding of variation, natural and sexual selection, uh, DNA and RNA, um, excuse me, mutation, gene flow and um, genetic drift. Okay, make sure I cover everything. Yes. Now that we have an understanding of basic evolution, we'll focus on evolutionary psychology and the emotions. The chapter that we read for this topic was by Cosmides and Tubi, published in 2000, entitled Evolutionary Psychology and the Emotions, okay? So according to Cosmides and Tubi, an evolutionary perspective on cognition leads one to view the mind as consisting of domain-specific programs that have a functional specialization for solving different adaptive problems that arose during evolutionary history. The evolution of cognitive traits follows the same principles as the evolution of physical traits. So we've, we can look at the evolution of the ear. We can look at the evolution of hearing. We can look at the evolution of language, right? And we're drawing upon the same evolutionary principles to explain the origin and development of physical and cognitive traits, modules, or abilities. This is a nice framework that helps us understand the computational level of any information processing unit, okay? So before we have been focusing on physical traits, for example, bills, right, the structure of the bills or the pigment of the skin, okay, but those were just sort of clear cases for us to get the main idea, but now we can apply that same idea to not just physical traits, but cognitive traits, okay, or mental traits, okay. Cosmides and Tubi suggest that one can define the mind as a set of information processing procedures or cognitive programs that are physically embodied in the neural circuitry of the brain. Cosmides and Tubi deny that cognition applies only to a subset of mental operations, such as reasoning, but um, does not apply to other operations such as emotions, all right? So Cosmides and Tubi deny that. Some people think that cognition applies only to sort of rational faculties, but not the emotions. So, you know, you may hear people talking about how the emotions influence cognition as if the emotions are non-cognitive, okay? Cosmides and Tubi are gonna deny that point and suggest that cognition includes the emotions, okay? Cognition applies to all the mental operations, okay, including the emotional ones. And 
just as we can think of the human body as consisting of different adaptations for survival and reproduction, right? I have a visual system, I, I have eyes and a visual system that help me navigate the world and avoid predators and find food, okay? But I also have sort of arms for protection or for re recruiting food as well. Um, I have um, olfaction, auditory perception, right? I have sort of a collection of adaptations and I'm sort of the bearer of this collection of adaptations for survival, okay? In a way you could think of my body as like a Swiss army knife, right? I'm, I'm this, um, I'm this thing that has multiple functions for survival, just like a Swiss army knife is a thing that has multiple tools to perform different functions in it, okay? Similarly, just as my body is a Swiss army knife with different functional adaptations, similarly, the mind is something like this as well, right? You can think of the mind as consisting of different specialized information processing units, just like my body as uh, specialized physical units, right? And we can think of when we're, when we're looking at the cognitive neuroscience of language that some areas are specialized for processing syntactic information and other areas are specialized for processing more uh, semantic information and so on, okay? So you can think of, you know, and just like we saw BA17 is gonna be for uh, primary, primary visual cortex and whatnot, that our, our brains and minds are also something like a Swiss army knife of different functional capacities, okay? So our psychological mechanisms also function as these sort of information processing units or procedures. And the mind is not just a neutral information processor, but also is such that it assigns hedonic values or weights to actions and things in the world, which is gonna be useful in helping to guide our behavioral decision-making processes, okay? In other words, cognitions are not neutral, but value-laden, right? And this is sort of piggybacking on the point that I made last lecture is that when I see an apple, Right? I don't see it first and foremost as uh, just a, a three-dimensional, a detached three-dimensional object, right? But it affords or solicits something from me. It's edible or delicious, right? There's a, a val it's value-laden, right? Um, and that my world is value-laden is highly useful for me because it helps to solicit action, okay? The general idea applied to human cognition is that the theory of evolution can help us understand the computational level of our cognitive processes, such as spatial navigation, facial recognition, language comprehension, and so on, for all of our marvelous cognitive abilities. The mind is something like a Swiss army knife with many different component parts and specialized functions. However, Cosmides and Tubi suggest that the coordination of the mind's many subordinate programs must be accomplished by a set of superordinate programs. Okay, so Cosmides and Tubi, what they're suggesting here is that, okay, in some sense, I'm a collection of different functional tools. And similarly, my mind is a collection of specialized functional tools, okay? However, in some sense, all these tools would be a complete mess if they were um, integrated or coordinated in a way, in a certain way, right? Like imagine if there was no coordination among these different parts here, like there was no uh, superordinate structure that held all these parts in line and allowed them to work in an integrated way with each other, right? In a similar way, you can think of the mind as being sort of a grab bag of 
functionally specialized components, but that itself poses uh, an adaptive problem in that how do we coordinate these many different components um, in an integrated way, okay? So according to Cosmides and Tubi, the emotions are adaptations that have arisen in response to the adaptive problem of coordinate, coordinating the mind's many sub-programs, okay? So you can think of the fact that I have a, a fight or flight response um, physiologically, right? The fact that I have long-term memory, the fact that I have a visual system, right? These might be all disintegrated, right? Like I might have these as individual parts, but what I need is something to unify them all as one system and not just different independent subsystems, right? And the insight here is that the emotions might serve as such a superordinate program that helps to coordinate the subprograms. Okay. For Cosmides and Tubi, the emotions cannot simply be reduced to physiology or behavior, right? Because part of what the emotions do is coordinate physiology and behavior with each other and with other information processing systems within the human organism, right? So some theorists, right, will say the emotions just are physiology, right? Like they're reducible to physiology, right? Others might think that the emotions are reducible to external behaviors, right? And, you know, in depending on the type of psychologist you are, you might try to reduce the emotions to one thing or another, okay? The important thing here from this approach is that the emotions are not reducible in that way to any one component part because the emotions serve the superordinate function of coordinating many component parts. And if the emotions were just one of those parts, it couldn't serve that superordinate coordinating function, okay? You can almost think as like the... Um, emotional system as something like a conductor, right? That helps to coordinate the individual band members, right? Each of which is specialized to perform a particular type of task. So Cosmides and Tubi suggest that every species has a universal species typical evolved architecture. And that for humans, this involves subordinate information processing programs and superordinate information processing programs, right? Those subordinate programs might include things like physical preparation for fight or flight. And the superordinate programs include things like emotion of anger or fear. So we can think of the emotions, like I might have an emotion such as anger, right? And the idea here is the function of anger as an emotion is that it helps tie together different appropriate responses, right? Anger might do a couple things for me. One is it might elicit a physiological response, right? I might start, my heart might start pumping and that can help increase blood circulation through my body so that my muscles are prepared for either um, fight, right? If I wanna engage or flight, if I wanna run, right? Either way, I, I need blood through my, a pump through my body, like to my legs and my upper body, if I'm gonna engage in combat or run away, okay? So we see that being angry is gonna have a physiological aspect to it, but also it's gonna have a, a facial aspect to it. Like it's gonna produce a response in my facial expression. Right. So when I get angry, not only will my heart start pumping blood through my body for action, but also I may have an automatic spontaneous facial expression. Right. Say someone, you know, pulled a gun on my family or pulled a knife on my family. Well, I might my heart's going to start pumping, ready to engage, but also my face might spontaneously flash anger. 
right? And depending on the perpetrator, my genuine expression, right? Like my facial expression may scare them off, right? They may realize like, oh, this person's angry instead of fearful, right? Um, maybe this isn't the person, maybe this is not the right time to do this, right? Um, so the facial expression serves as like an honest indicator of my, uh, an honest indicator of my overall disposition for action, right? Like that I might physically engage this person and that I feel confident about doing so, okay? Um, also, not just from like an expressive, me expressing my emotion to someone else, but also perceiving someone else's emotion, right? If I perceive someone else's angry expression, that gives me a sense of what they might, what their intended action might be. And that allows me to modify like a game plan or a strategy in response to their anger, right? So that's to say facial expression serves as both an ex it serves a function both as an expressor of the emotion, but also as the interpreter of other people's emotions. Okay, so we see that anger has a function, right, in that it can help coordinate my physiological arousal level with my facial expression, and maybe also uh, bring up to mind relevant aspects in memory, right? Like my the skills that I acquired um, in the military through training, through survival training, through uh, martial arts training, and so on, right? I'm going to be sort of ready for action, okay? And the emotion helps to align all the things appropriately, okay? And notice that if I wasn't angry but afraid, I would, a lot of different things would occur, okay? And if I wasn't angry or afraid but happy, then very different pairings and coordinations would be going on to express like happiness, right? Like when I see my friend that I haven't seen in forever, right? I need to solicit a very different response, right? Or if I see someone that I'm attracted to and I wanna, you know, engage them in a positive way, well, obviously I don't wanna be angry, right? That would be a maladaptive response. So we see that it's important that we coordinate responses in the appropriate way, um, and the emotions help us to do that. Okay, so when I'm happy, I'll smile and my physiology will be slightly different, all right, and whatnot. All right, and just reiterating some important points in this rather long lecture today, uh, mutations to an information processing design feature that degrades that biological machine's ability to solve survival promoting and reproduction promoting tasks will decrease their own frequency over subsequent generations until they become universally eliminated from the species design, okay? So if there's a mutation, right, not just to our physical attributes, but to those responsible for information processing, right, like cognitive modules or cognitive systems, right? If there's a mutation that degrades this system, say that there is a random mutation that resulted in highly impaired visual perception, right? Well, that's going to degrade that biological machine's survival promoting and reproduction promoting tasks and decrease its own frequency in subsequent generations until it's eventually eliminated, okay? A mutation for incredibly poor visual perception will not last long in, um, it, it will not last long through subsequent generations, okay? On the other hand, mutations to an information processing design feature that improves that biological machine's ability to solve survival promoting and reproduction promoting tasks will increase their own frequency over subsequent generations until they become universally incorporated into the species design, right? Say you have a random mutation that makes you have a beautiful physical configuration like peacock feathers, right? Or makes you incredibly intelligent, 
or improves your long-term memory vastly, right? That sort of random mutation would increase sort of the fitness of uh, that individual, right? And would lead to, right? If, if I had a mutation that made me incredibly smart and funny, right? Then that would help me live longer and um, reproduce with more partners and create more offspring that have my genes in subsequent generations, okay? Until, you know, in the future, like everyone is more, uh, everyone is funnier and smarter or whatnot. Cosmides and Tubi suggest that natural selection is the only force in nature that can build functional organization into organisms, okay? And so Cosmides and Tubi, the important thing here is that we're trying to find an alternative explanatory framework to account for sort of purposeful or functional specialization, right? We don't want sort of uh, to posit some God or some random entity to account for all the functional specializations that we have, right? Um, so we don't wanna say, well, why do we have language? Well, it was given to us. Like, why do uh, peacocks have feathers? Well, it was just given to them, right? In some sense, it's like, hmm, right? It's not really explaining anything, right? Like, we might as well just say magic, right? Like, why do we have this? Magic. Why is anything the way it is? Magic, right? It's not really a, a helpful explanation. It doesn't help us understand, right? Here, though, we see that we have a useful framework for understanding functional specialization in organisms. Like, why do we have language or why do we have vision? Why do peacocks have feathers, right? Well, it helps to solve a recurring problem in the environment, right? It helps us, this trait, whatever it is, physical or cognitive, helps us survive. It helps us reproduce. And insofar as it helps me to survive, it's helping provide me with more reproductive opportunities, okay? And that's uh, useful and a useful explanatory framework um, because it explains why this becomes more widespread and even universal among a species, right? Because ultimately we want to ex explain like universal features in a species. Like why do all birds have wings or whatnot? Why do all humans use a language, right? Things like that. And this is giving us an explanatory framework to address those questions. Okay. Answer questions at the computational level of analysis. Because of the different roles played by chance and selection, the evolutionary process builds three different types of outcomes into organisms. Adaptations, which are functional machinery built by selection. Byproducts of adaptations, which are present in the design of organisms because they are causally coupled to traits that were selected for and random noise. This is injected by mutation, other random processes, right? So we can ask of an organism, why does it have that thing? Why does it have that behavior? It might be an adaptation, right? It might be a spandrel, right? A byproduct or random noise. The cosmides and Tubi suggest that the emotion of sexual jealousy is an example of an adaptation in that it can coordinate behaviors, thoughts, and actions in an appropriate way. An example of a byproduct is stress-induced physical deterioration. And an example of random noise suggested by Cosmides and Tubi is bipolar depression. Adaptive problems are evolutionarily long enduring recurring clusters of conditions that constitute either reproductive opportunities or reproductive obstacles. A design feature may be said to solve an adaptive problem to the extent that its presence in an organism increases that organism's net lifespan reproduction or reproduction of kin. The emotion of anger, for example, may serve an adaptive function of coordinating an honest display to others, such as the facial expression of anger, with the appropriate preparation for action 
For example, increasing heart rate and blood flow through the body to prepare for combat in order to protect resources and kin from threats, for example. Now we, we see an example here, okay? Where we might have like uh, motivations, physiological changes and facial actions and the motions help us to coordinate these. The idea is that those with well-functioning emotion systems, including anger, will be best coordinated in their response to recurring adaptive problems in the environment, such as threats, and consequently will produce more offspring with well-functioning emotion systems for subsequent generations. Cosmides and Tubi suggest that current human behavior is generated by information processing mechanisms that were constructed in the past because they solved adaptive problems in ancestral environments where the human line evolved. And I emphasize the past here because our mechanisms, our information processing mechanisms or modules and our physical traits are not solutions to present day problems. They can be if our present day problems are the same as our ancestral problems, right? The important thing here is that our attributes are a consequence of adaptations for ancient problems, right? Problems of our ancestors and not for like problems of 2022, okay? And this is important to appreciate because it points out that there can be a misfit between mechanisms that evolved for ancestral conditions and current conditions provided by contemporary society. Okay. And this can help us to understand like why certain aspects of our brain and behavior and our physical structure may not be optimal for today. Okay. So for example, you may say, well, why do I love fatty foods so much, right? Clearly that's maladaptive because if I eat fatty foods all day, I will um, gain a lot of weight. That'll have a negative impact, right? At some level, that'll have a negative impact on my um, physical functioning, right? And it can lead to stroke and death, right? So why would I desire fatty food if it can be highly harmful for me. Right? And the reason is, is because the desire for fatty food didn't evolve today, but evolved in ancient periods or in an, in an environment where food scarcity was a problem, right? Food was not widely available like it was, like it is today. So um, given the fact that humans may have to go for days or long periods of time without food, right? Um, the, when opportunity presented itself to gorge on high quality, high caloric food content, those opportunities were taken, right? Those, um, the opportunity to desire fat, right? Um, a high caloric, um, something that's high in calories, right? That that's adaptive for us, right? Because those of us that ate high, high calorie foods were able to survive from hunt to hunt better, right? And therefore live long enough to reproduce. Um, whereas those that maybe did not desire fatty foods um, had a harder time surviving from hunt to hunt, right? More of them would have died out, um, not been as successful in reproduction, right? And also, you know, having enough fat is related to testosterone levels. So we could see that making sure that we eat enough calories and fat is important for both hunting and reproductive purposes. So um, given that high fatty foods were adaptive in ancient uh, conditions, right? The conditions of our ancestors, it makes sense why that was something that evolved in us. Okay. However, given the pace of technology and the availability of food, now we see how that evolved architecture can be slightly maladaptive. Okay.
in this article by Cosmides and Tubi, they deny that evolutionary psychologists equate adaptive problems exclusively with short run threats to physical survival. Uh, Cosmides and Tubi deny that evolved computational adaptations must be crude or primitive in design, but rather evolved computational adaptations can be incredibly complex. All right, and the last article for today that we're gonna cover is Facial Expressions by Paul Ekman. So most of the research on universals and facial expressions of emotions have focused on a particular method. And this method involves showing pictures of facial expressions to observers in different cultures who are then asked to judge what emotion is shown, All right? So I can take an, uh, a sample of photos, for example, this sample right here, and I can show these photos to people in different cultures and ask them what emotion is being shown in the picture. If the observers in the different cultures label the facial expressions with the same term, right? Say I go to every culture that I can find around the world and even those cultures where they don't have TV or maybe they've never seen a Westerner before, right? Um, if we go to every culture and they're all identifying, for example, this face with the same label, like angry, right? Then that would be interpreted as evidence for cultural universality of facial expressions. On the other hand, if the observers in different cultures labeled the expression with different terms, so say I took this image all around the world and across all different cultures, they all gave that image a different label, right? Maybe some labeled it angry, some labeled it happy, some labeled it surprised, some labeled it disgusted, right? Well, if that was the case, then this would be interpreted as evidence of cultural diversity. Charles Darwin suggested that facial expressions are universal across cultures. And Ray Birdwhistle suggested that facial expressions are specific to each culture. So it's sort of nice when we have within the literature, people that take opposing views, right? And then we can sort of uh, create an argument, right? Uh, one person argues for the P, another argues that not P. And then we can um, provide data or consider arguments for which case we find most plausible. So the six basic universal facial expressions include the following, anger, disgust, fear, happiness, sadness, and surprise. And we label these as the six basic universal facial expressions of emotion. And they're provided up here. This is a newer photo. This is a more traditional photo from the time of Ekman. And we consider these basic universal facial expressions because there's wide agreement, almost universal agreement in these expressions. In 21 out of 21 countries studied, the majority of participants agreed about the pictures that showed disgust, happiness, and sadness. So for disgust, happiness, and sadness, there was universal agreement on these facial expressions, okay? 21 out of 21 countries, the majority of the participants agreed on those expressions. In 20 out of 21 countries, the majority of participants agreed about the pictures that showed surprise. In 19 out of 21 countries, the majority of participants agreed about the pictures that showed fear. And in 18 out of 21 countries, the majority of participants agreed about the pictures that showed anger. So we see that for the most part, right, for most participants in most countries, there's wide agreement on what each of these expressions indicate. Ekman suggests that there is a strong case 
for the universality of facial expressions for basic emotions. Since no empirical research to date has shown that the facial expressions that the majority of people in one country judged as showing an emotion such as anger were judged as showing another emotion such as fear by the majority in another culture. In other words, most people across cultures agree on which facial expression is for sadness, happiness, and so on. If facial expressions are universal, then Americans who have never seen any, pe any people from New Guinea before should have no problem judging what emotions they're showing. And results from empirical research suggest that this is the case. Since people from New Guinea who have never seen Americans before have no problem judging what emotions they're showing in pictures. In other empirical research, it was found that judgments made by Japanese and American participants who saw videotapes of spontaneous facial expressions were very similar. In other empirical research by cameras and colleagues that measured Japanese and American infants facial responses to arm restraints, Japanese and American infants displayed similar emotional expressions. In yet other empirical research by Ekman, Davidson, and Friesen that measured EEG activity while participants watched emotionally provocative films, it was found that different patterns of brain activity occurred when disgust or a genuine smile was spontaneously shown. Finally, in other empirical research by Ekman, Levinson, and Friesen, it was found that different patterns of autonomic nervous system activity occurred with different facial expressions. So we see that using different methods, behavioral methods, where we have people respond to different stimulus with a behavior, like a verbal report, like that sadness or happiness or so on, um, as well as using methods from neuroscience, right? Like EEG, right? Looking at um, difference in neural and physiological responses. We see that people discriminate consistently, right? Um, among the emotions, the basic emotions. So although spontaneous facial expressions of emotion are universal, which we see from the evidence we just discussed, Interestingly enough, research has shown that display rules for showing emotions through facial expressions vary across cultures. So for example, in certain cultures, there are strong norms against displaying negative emotions, such as anger or disgust after a loss in sports. Whereas in other cultures, it may be acceptable to display these emotions. So, Ekman suggests that evolution has provided humans with universal facial expressions. We all spontaneously smile after we win, but that the display rules for showing emotional facial expressions are different across cultures. So for example, I may actively inhibit or mask my smile since in my specific culture, there are norms against being too proud of your own success. And we see that here in these photos here, right? People spontaneous, there's a spontaneous smile there, um, but it's being actively masked or inhibited through other actions, other facial actions, okay? All right. And then finally, we'll look at uh, muscles of the face. So instead of thinking of the face as one massive holistic object, we can think of the face as consisting of facial action units. We can then use these distinct basic action units to build more complex facial expressions. Here's a fun project. Determine which action units or AUs are involved in the facial expression of the six basic emotions. Identify the action units involved in the following six emotions, anger, disgust, fear, happiness, sadness, and surprise. And here's a nice image of all the facial muscles, all the muscles we have in our face. 
Cone and Bedar and Ekman suggest that facial expressions can be decomposed into action units using the facial action coding system. Comprehensive facts coding of facial expressions, for example, enabled the discovery that self-reported embarrassment is uniquely associated with a particular sequence of action units. The action unit activated first is AU12. The action unit activated second is AU24. And the action units activated last were AU51 and 54. The important insight here is that we can use action units of the face to identify universal basic emotions, more complex emotions, as well as emotions that unfold over time. We can use the ideas and principles behind the fact system to study facial expressions in other animals, such as chimpanzees, other non-human primates, dogs, and yet other animals. And there have been some very cool papers published using uh, facial action coding for, for example, dogs, horses, and whatnot. And here are some examples of action units and the facial muscles that these action units identify. AU1 identifies the inner brow razor, the frontalis pars medialis. AU4 identifies the brow lower, the corrugator supercilii, and the depressor supercilii. AU5 identifies the upper lid razor, the levator palpebrae superioris. And AU24 identifies the lip, lip presser, orbicularis oris. AU12 identifies the lip corner puller or the zygomaticus major. AU18 identifies the lip puckerer. And I'll just go ahead and point that out to you right here. AU44 identifies the squint. AU51 identifies a head turn to the left. AU54 identifies a head turn downward. And AU61 identifies eyes turning to the left. And these are just examples from the book to help you sort of understand how to find the AU action unit, the description and corresponding facial muscles along with an example image, okay? And uh, I encourage you to spend some time looking through the facts system on your own, okay? But I'm on 5% battery, so I'm gonna try to wrap it up um, quickly. All right, so today we focus primarily on the computational level of understanding an information processing system. Regarding this level of analysis, recall that Mar asked, what is the goal of the computation? Why is it appropriate? And what is the logic of the strategy by which it can be carried out? So today we thought about the goals of information processing operations, cognitions or computations, and the logic of the strategy for their development and execution. For example, questions we were concerned with today included the following. What is the function or objective of the emotions? In other words, what do the emotions do? And we discovered in this lecture that the emotions evolved as superordinate programs that solved the adaptive problem of coordinating subordinate programs of the mind. How do emotions evolve? In other words, why do we have emotions? Well, the emotions evolved much as other traits and modules evolved evolution by natural selection. What is the function or objective of facial expressions? In other words, what do facial expressions do? Facial expressions function as an honest signal of human emotions and therefore likely actions. And how do facial expressions evolve? In other words, why do we have facial expressions? And again, facial expressions evolve much as other traits and modules evolved evolution by natural selection. The story will become more nuanced and complex. However, this is a good place to start for today.
since we needed to draw upon evolutionary biology and anthropology in our discussion of human cognitive evolution, another main goal for today was to appreciate the contributions from evolutionary biology and anthropology to our knowledge of the human mind. That is to say, anthropology is an important part of cognitive science. So we spent some time today gaining a basic understanding of evolution by natural and sexual selection. As a brief review, today we discussed how forces of natural selection include mutation or any change to the DNA sequence of an organism. We covered natural and sexual selection, the differential survival and reproduction of individuals due to differences in phenotype. Talked about gene flow, or the movement of genes from one population to another as a result of dispersal and genetic drift, random changes in how common an allele is within a population. We also discussed important concepts such as genotype or the genetic material of an organism and phenotype, the observable traits or characteristics of an organism. And we also talked about genotype phenotype mapping or the fact that certain parts of my genetic sequence correspond to the fact that I have a certain eye color or hair color and so on. We also covered variation, the concept of variation or the fact that the individuals of a species differ from one another or exhibit variation. And we saw that uh, finches have different types of bills and humans have different pigments of skin and so on. Natural selection um, has to do with the fact that in certain environments, certain traits are adaptive, whereas others are maladaptive, right? So thinner bills are more adaptive for an environment that requires probing, whereas thicker bills are more adaptive for an environment that requires crushing. We also saw today that not all traits have a clear survival advantage, but rather some uh, traits are a result of sexual selection rather than natural selection. An example of this was the tails of peacocks, right? This is a nice example of sexual selection since tails contribute, relative, contribute to relatively greater reproductive success, but not necessarily to greater uh, survival. And we saw that adaptive physical and cognitive traits such as characteristics, modules, or information processing units are passed along to offspring. And that covers our lecture on evolutionary psychology, the emotions, and facial expressions. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture and that you found the discussion of evolution uh, fascinating and useful. Our goal for the next lecture tomorrow is going to be to focus on the evolution of language and music. But once again, thank you for your attention today. I hope you enjoyed the lecture, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for our next lecture.